beautiful soul. Have you ever wanted to speak to angels? Do you believe angels can support you in your daily life? If this is you, go to my website homepage, theangelmedium.com and sign up for my weekly angel message email. As a gift for signing up, I'm giving you access to free resources, including 31 healing meditations that, if you do daily, are going to help you hear your angels and your own intuition more clearly. Start using these today and you'll see changes in 31 days. Now, take a deep breath. Feel the presence of your angels as they fill you with love, joy, peace, bliss, and ease. And remember, your angels say the messages that resonate with you in today's episode are meant just for you. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. And today you're in for a very special treat. We have world-renowned near-death expert, Dr. Evan Alexander on the show today to talk about his new book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And it says, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Heart of Consciousness. Um, I was fascinated as I read through the beginning of the book, Dr. Alexander. There is like probably 25 studies within the first 20 pages that I noted where you're like scientific fact after scientific fact after scientific fact. So I'm excited to have you on the show today because there's so many people out there who are awakening spiritually, but they have a spouse or they have somebody in their life who's like, eh, just a bunch of hooey, right? Like this isn't real. Today's episode is, I think, going to be a great one to listen to with your partner or a skeptic because, um, well, Dr. Eben Alexander is going to shed some light for us on that today. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be with you today. Yay, thank you. Um, So you were a neurosurgeon for over 25 years before you have this, um, I'm not going to pronounce the name right, but is it that brain on fire type of thing that ended up happening to you? No, this was much worse. This was a lethal case of, or or near lethal case of bacterial meningoencephalitis, which is much worse than uh, pretty much any other kind of brain infection you can have. It basically doesn't leave room uh, when you spend a week in coma due to a bacteria like that. Uh, Those are not cases where you actually have somebody make a full recovery. And that's why I think the medical community is taking such interest in my case is uh, just that the recovery is absolutely uh, unprecedented in medical literature. Although interestingly, when you look at near-death experiences, you find there are uh, often examples of people who come back and have miraculous healing. Now, of course, that should not be a giant surprise. The fact that they're visiting the realm of the dead and then being able to make a a recovery and come back to this world obviously shows some kind of connection and role for that spiritual uh, world in our healing. And that's where uh, Karen and I often go in our uh, meditation workshops, play shops, what have you, uh, is helping people come into healing. Because that's really the most important lesson from NDEs is the power we have as spiritual beings to come into wholeness, you know, to heal ourselves. And that's why, to me, my uh, journey almost 14 years ago now, back in November 2008, when the severe bacterial meningoencephalitis has been such a gift in my life. And I've spent those 14 years working with scientists around the world. Uh, and there are hundreds of scientists who get this, that you know the materialist model is dead. In fact, materialism, the notion that brain creates consciousness, that model died almost a century ago with the advent of quantum physics. But it's taken us such a long, hard time to figure it out because we have to dive really deep to start getting into uh, where all this fits together. And that's where uh, this uh, kind of exciting uh, new thrust from scientists around the world, like people like the Galileo Commission, Medical and Scientific Network, uh, 
we're all groups of scientists who are trying to explain this, the primacy of consciousness and the evidence for non-local consciousness. So it's, it's a very uh, exciting time to be alive. Uh, incredible. So my question then is, why are there some doctors that are still holding on to this notion that the brain creates consciousness? And I guess we should back up just a tad for those of uh, the listeners who aren't familiar with your work. When you had this disease and it's infecting your brain and you're in this coma, I'm not, I'm not going to say this right, so you can kind of take it and then tell it in the right way. Um your brain, there is no activity going on, right? Like where doctors should be able to look at your brain and say, this is what your brain looks like when it's having thought. You shouldn't be able to, you can't have thought if there's no brain activity going on. So you went back, you looked at your brain scans, you looked at, at the activity within your brain while you're in this coma. You shouldn't have been having thought and yet you had this near-death experience. And tell people, too, what that was like. What was it like when you were on the other side? Okay, well, I think it's important to start out by saying, you know, it's not just my story and proof of heaven and the map of heaven and then living in a mindful universe, which continues my story. Um, but there was a medical case report done by three doctors who were not involved in my care, but fascinated by my recovery. And those, those doctors, uh, the case report came out 10 years after my coma in September of 2018 in Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases. And they make two very powerful points based on their extensive review of my medical records. One point um, is that my brain was way too damaged to have, you know, constructed this experience. Uh, when you mentioned it a few minutes ago about uh, looking at different parts of the brain, lighting up when we think, when we observe things, perceive, et cetera, uh, all of that work is looking at the neocortex because modern neuroscience believes the outer surface of the brain, the neocortex, the part that is, really makes us human, is absolutely essential to every bit of detailed conscious awareness. Everything we we see, hear, think, smell, feel, um, memory of historical events, uh, kind of projection of the future, executive action. Every bit of that occurs in that neocortex. That's why a gram-negative bacterial meningoencephalitis is such a perfect model for human death, because that kind of bacteria and meningoencephalitis attacks the brain and starts to destroy the neocortex from the outside in. And in fact, my scan showed that. I had full thickness damage to my neocortex in all the lobes of my brain. There was no place left for any kind of conscious awareness to happen. So how was it that I had the most extraordinary, memorable, detailed, meaningful, powerful, life-changing set of events in my life occur at a time when my brain was demonstrably offline? Uh, so that was their first big point was there was no way for my brain to kind of produce a dream or hallucination. The second major point they make is probably most important for so many people to understand, and that is that my recovery is unprecedented in medical literature. You just don't find these, these cases. Although, as I mentioned a minute ago, in the NDE literature, you do find other people coming very close to death in many different ways who then have these incredible spiritual journeys that then allow them to come into healing and come back to this world. Like uh, Anita Morjani, who's uh, you know dying to be me, is about her lymphoma, which which her cancer that just vanished when she had an NDE and came back to this world. Or Dr. Mary C. Neal, who wrote the book To Heaven and Back, orthopedic surgeon, kayaking accident in Chile, late 1990s who uh, had an over 30 minute warm water drowning. And anybody in medicine will tell you over 30 minute warm water drowning, forget it. That person is not going to come back. But she was brought to the surface dead. They resuscitated her, brought her back to this world. So these cases show us uh, the incredible power of a spiritual journey and awareness in bringing on healing. That's why it's so important. Now then to get to the second part of your question, very briefly, I will dive into what my experience involved, uh, and then we can dissect that out more if you'd like. But briefly, uh, important to point out that I, the entire journey that I had in a week in coma in November of 2008 <clears throat> was 
amnesic. I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life. I had no knowledge of Earth, this universe, no language. Uh, every bit of it was gone. It was an empty slate. Now, that was unusual for an NDE. <clears throat> and to me, it simply shows mine was was incomplete, as most NDEs are, but it's the way they come together and the information they give us that does give us a very complete picture of what happens when we die. Uh, but the uh, interesting thing to me, that amnesia allowed for an extraordinary journey. And only over the months and year or two after my coma did I realize why it was so important that I not remember anything and have no preconceptions, no assumptions about the world, but had to face it uh, completely afresh in this NDE journey. It started in what I call Earthworm's Eye View, very primitive course on responsive realm, like being in dirty jello. I had no body awareness during this entire experience. And also it seemed to go forever in that early Earthworm Eye View phase, but luckily it didn't. I was rescued by a slowly spinning white light that came with a perfect musical melody and led up into this brilliant ultra real gateway valley. And the gateway valley, had many Earth-like features. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly. There were millions of other butterflies looping in these vast formations. There was this incredible meadow of perfect fertility, fecundity, uh, beauty uh, bound below us, uh, surrounded by forest, uh, no sign of any death or decay. There were thousands of beings down this meadow and they were all dancing and joy and merriment, and children playing, dogs jumping, incredible festivities, all being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs orbs of angelic choirs. Uh, and these orbs were these pure spiritual beings uh, leaving these golden dusty trails against the blue black velvety sky. But the most important thing was they were emanating these chants, anthems, hymns that would just thunder through my awareness. Um, and it was in this beautiful environment that I, I had this uh, sense of a soft summer breeze blowing through. That was my first awareness of the divine, of that infinitely healing God force uh, of love, compassion, kindness, mercy, uh, and creation right at the core of our very conscious awareness that I came to know in this journey, as have many in the ears. In fact, I would say all of our religious systems are based on similar journeys, coming back to this world, and then trying to share that journey uh, with our fellow humans. Uh, so anyway, uh, in this beautiful uh, gateway valley on this butterfly wing, I wasn't alone. There was a beautiful young woman, sparkling blue eyes, high forehead, high cheekbones, broad smile, soft brown hair. She was dressed in, this, dressed in the same kind of simple peasant garb, but very colorful uh, that all the villagers, uh, souls between lives dancing in this meadow also wore. And she looked at me with a look of pure love and she never said a word, she never had to. Uh, her message to me, which was delivered telepathically with this deep emotional engagement, heart-to-heart -heart communication, was you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are deeply loved. Uh, and another part in that, in proof of heaven, in that message was you can do no wrong. And I'm sorry I didn't explain that much more fully. Many people misunderstand that. They think, oh, so we can do anything we want. That's not at all true. Uh, what these journeys and these kind of uh, adventures are meant to convey to us is the importance of love, oneness, kindness, that we're all in this together, uh, acceptance, mercy, that we're here to take care of the least, the last, and the lost. There are very crucial aspects of that part of the journey that <clears throat> what I was trying to convey is you have free will. You have the gift of free will. That's what God has given us. Uh, to share in this co-creative effort. And that free will is what we are most responsible for. And uh, I would say that the free will of humanity right now is not very good. Uh, and we need to really up our game. And that involves getting away from this notion of egocentrism and me-focused world, because that's so toxic. It's, it's deadly, and it's what's killing our planet and killing each of us individually. The more we realize we're here to help others, to share, <clears throat> and to manifest that love and healing for all fellow beings is how we get healing in our own lives. Now, it turns out that Gateway Valley was only a gateway, and th there was yet another portal to higher and higher levels. And that portal was opened up through the music of these angelic choirs. Music was always the way to engage between portals. And I'm sure your people will realize this is not music limited by our ears. We don't have limitations of our eyes and our brain that limits the information. 
there we're, we're drinking from consciousness, like from a fire hose and it is full bore. That's how come you go through life review, life flashing before your eyes, all that kind of amazing stuff that's happened in reports going back thousands of years across all cultures. And that is a very real aspect of this. Your life flashing before your eyes, the life review, as it's often called, is an incredible uh, process where we realize that self is um, a fiction, that we're all truly sharing this together because the life review is most commonly described as feeling the impact of your actions and thoughts on those around you. You don't experience a life review from your own perspective. It's from the bigger perspective of all involved. And that's where we learn that the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated, is written into the very fabric of the universe. Friend, do you ever wonder if you're in the right career? Do you find yourself thinking, there's got to be more to life than this? Do you want to know why God, Universe Source, called your soul here, now? Find out who you really are. I'm teaching a brand new course with all new content to help you find your purpose in 30 days. Class begins October 1st or watch the replay at any time. Find the clarity, direction, fulfillment you've been searching for. The class is called Find Your Purpose in 30 Days. For early bird pricing, use the coupon code Early Bird Purpose. Sign up today at theangelmedium.com. Also, the winner of this month's free reading with me is in the show notes. Leave a five star positive review of my podcast or book, and you could be next month's winner. But anyway, to kind of finish this brief description, which hasn't been too brief, uh, in that core realm, uh, that was kind of the ultimate destination of my journey. And I went there several times because I would tumble from there back down to the lowliest starting point of my journey. And I had to work my way back up by remembering the musical notes, the melodies, and then the angelic choir. So, <clears throat> but every time I was reassured by that beautiful, loving presence. But in the core realm, that's where I saw all of four dimensional space time had collapsed down, all of that spiritual realm that enables kind of meta time or uh, deep time, as I often call it. That is that you can witness, relive your life. It's not a remembering, it's a reliving of the events of life in detailed fashion. And it can happen like that in earth time, and yet it's complete. Uh, and so in this, uh, in this core realm, I witnessed that oneness with the divine, with becoming one with that God force. And in fact, what I would say, is the very source of our uh, conscious awareness is that God force of love, kindness, compassion that links us all together. And that's what this world needs to wake up to. Now, I would cycle through these realms many, many times. All that is described in the book, Proof of Heaven. But ultimately, what happened was, as they told me, every time I entered the core realm, you're not here to stay, you'll be going back, we'll teach you many things. Well, there came a time when I tried to conjure up that melody to bring the portal to take me up out of the earthworm I view into the Gateway Valley, and no, it wouldn't work. They'd promised me that would be the case someday, and I was like, oh, no. Uh, but the reality is I knew I could trust in the universe at that point, that I would be taken care of. And that's when I witnessed thousands of beings going off into the distance, heads bowed, some holding candles, this murmuring energy coming from them. The surprising thing was even though I was back down in these murkiest kind of earthworm eye view realms where it all started, now with this beautiful energy coming from these beings, I felt the same elation, joy, and bliss that I'd felt in the higher spiritual realms. And what I came to realize is that was the power of prayer. That was the connection. That was what was bringing me back to this world. I had no idea how to get here on my own, but those prayers were doing that. And not only that, but then I witnessed six faces that were very important. They would come up out of the muck. They'd say a few words that I didn't understand, then they'd disappear. And those faces were important because five of them were physically present in the ICU room the last 24 hours of coma. And there were many family and friends who were not in those memories who had been there earlier, which means the entire coma journey had to happen between days one and five or day, days one and four. Uh, and I go through all the, uh, you know, the veridical time information in the book Proof of Heaven. But that's the fact of it was that those faces showed me that the whole journey happened at that time in the journey, not when I was going in, not when I was coming out, 
Uh, and when I did wake up in that uh, ICU bed on day seven of coma, it was a Sunday morning. They, the doctors had just had a family conference where they said I'd gone from 10% chance of survival down to 2% chance, but no chance of recovery. So they were recommending stopping the antibiotics and just letting me die. Uh, my youngest son, Bond, had been through this week. They protected him from the worst news. He was 10 years old at the time, but he uh, overheard that recommendation by the doctor who was time to let me die. And that's when he knew, oh my God, it's horrible. Ran down the room, uh, uh, hallway into my ICU bed. I'm lying there on a ventilator as I had been for seven days, eyes taped shut. He pulls open my eyelids, one eye looking over there, one eye down there, neither pupil working. Those of you in medicine know that's a horrible picture. I promise you, I didn't see him with my eyes. I didn't hear him with my ears, but his pleading with me, daddy, you're gonna be okay. Daddy, you're gonna be okay. Didn't understand the words, but all of a sudden everything mattered. I had gone through this entire journey with this amnesia thinking this can all continue. It can cease, doesn't matter. And now all of a sudden I realize it matters tremendously that this other soul needed me. I could tell from that pleading tone. So somehow I had to come back. Toughest thing I've ever done in my life. But I did come back to this world. And when I did, I didn't even recognize loved ones at the bedside. Uh, my mother, my sisters, my sons. I had no idea who these beings were, but I knew where I had just been. That was sharp and crystal clear in my mind. In fact, those memories are as sharp today as if the whole thing happened yesterday. Uh, and that has been a tremendous gift of it. And that's what has driven me over 14 years. I did recover all my memories over about two months. Language and personal memories came back very quickly over hours, a few days. Uh, but it took longer for my neuroscience knowledge, cosmology, physics, all of that to come back to me. But over two months, it pretty much all returned. And surprisingly enough, as we discuss in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, where we cover the topic that memories are not even stored in the brain, um, you know, that was just a giant uh, gift to me, was going through every bit of that kind of awakening and understanding, coming to realize the memories were more complete now than they had been before my coma. Um, and all of it has been a tremendous gift. And that's why I continue working today with scientists around the world to help bring this tremendous story of the primacy of consciousness and our oneness with that divine God force to the fore. We need to understand this. We've got way too uh, intoxicated with this stupid uh, egocentrism and ego maniacism. And it is time to realize we're all in this together. This is, we're sharing one mind. That's one of the deepest principles emerging from the modern neuroscience of consciousness. And that's what I'm here to share because of the importance it has in helping us heal, both as individuals, as cultures, as societies, and as humanity at large. Okay, I have a hundred questions for you, but I only have you for a limited amount of time. So I wanna kind of dive in here. Um, and I want to start with, there are a couple of skeptic scientists that I've heard say, um, and I'm not going to get the name of this chemical right, but that there's a, a chemical within the brain that spiritual awakening leads you to. And I think it's the same chemical that people get when they like microdose certain psychedelics. Well yeah, I can explain that in great detail because there's a lot to it, but I th you're probably referring to something like dimethyltryptamine, DMT, active principle, and ayahuasca as one example, but there's also LSD, um, which was a popular hallucinogen back in the 60s, and people are now microdosing with that out west, uh, mainly in California. Um, and then, of course, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and I have much to say about all of that, but I don't know exactly which direction you want to go in. Yes. So the the person that I heard on this podcast was like, all spiritual awakening is nothing more than your brain tapping into DMT. All near-death experiences are nothing more than your brain tapping into DMT. So that's where I want to go with this. They have it completely backwards. They really do. This is astonishing. I know uh, several people, like, for example, Sam Harris, uh, he, when he first heard of my story, he, he wrote out some articles about how it was crystal clear it was a DMT trip. He said, it's like the seams on the baseball were identical. Not only was I in the right ballpark as a DMT trip, but I was describing a DMT trip. This is the biggest problem because I've also tried some of the strongest forms of DMT in an effort to duplicate my, my NDE. I, I, I used 5-methoxy DMT, one of the most powerful such substances 
Massachusetts is known. In fact, I would say the most powerful. And what I can tell you is it gives you a tiny little glimpse, like looking through a little keyhole. Try You're looking at the spiritual realm. You are definitely into that territory, but it greatly restricts your ability to interact with that realm. And um, so they've got it totally backwards. What, what we need to say is that the brain is actually a filter that allows primordial consciousness in. Psychedelic substances allow an alteration of that filtering that can show you different, sometimes kind of magnified versions of that interaction. So they do give us glimpses of the spiritual realm, but only in tiny little bits. And in fact, I often recommend, and Karen and I do in our, our meditation play shops around the world, as we did in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, recommend a much better pathway to spiritual enlightenment is meditation. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've spent the last 11 years of my life uh, uh, really focusing on uh, binaural beat brainwave entrainment. Uh, and people who want to know more, just go to sacredacoustics.com, uh, truth, you know, true um, complete disclosure. That's Karen Newell's website. She's my partner, uh, co-author of the book. Uh, but we've done a tremendous amount of work together. And uh, all of it really shows the power of meditation. And binaural beat brainwave entrainment, you can learn more at sacredacoustics.com, but it's an extremely powerful way of getting into deep transcendental states of consciousness, which I use daily and have done for more than a decade. Uh, so I speak from the heart, uh, the, from experience. These are very, very powerful ways of connecting with uh, the spiritual realm and in a meaningful way that's very interactive and allows us to grow more fully into the souls we came here to be. But don't fall into the trap of thinking that if you pop this pill, you know, psilocybin, uh, DMT, um, LSD, what have you, that all of a sudden you're going to have all this great spiritual enlightenment. Uh, in fact, I would say it does give you that glimpse, but to truly get a deep relationship and come into a loving, lifelong relationship with that realm in ways that can help you come into wholeness and healing, meditation is absolutely the key. Do not fall into the trap of psychedelics. Although I also would point out that uh, I'm so glad that we're doing uh, medical research in psychedelics because, in, for example, with psilocybin, two very major effects uh, that are very beneficial and help us understand this spiritual connection I'm talking about. Um, psilocybin has been shown in recent scientific studies to be very helpful at alleviating some of the worst addictions known to man, nicotine, opiates, things like that. Right. And a, a therapeutic <laughs> dose of psilocybin in one or two settings can cure those addictions for months or years, uh, if not forever. Likewise, uh, debilitating fear of death in terminal cancer patients treated with psilocybin in a proper therapeutic setting, one or two doses is enough to alleviate their fear completely. Uh, and these are simply examples that given that you don't have to keep taking the psilocybin, but that it's the one or two doses, it's serving as a catalyst. And what I would argue and what we have studies that I'm working on trying to design to complete is to compare meditation with those substances and show how much uh, people can come into that same alignment without all the kind of... Um, splash of those psychedelic substances, because I think they create too much noise to be of great use to us. That's why meditation uh, with a steady daily program can be a much more facile means of our connecting with that spiritual realm. So I, I strongly urge meditation, not psychedelics, but I'm very glad that we're doing the research with the psychedelics, because in many ways that works in parallel to uh, describing the, uh, the enhancements to life that we can gain through meditation. So um, I'm so glad that you described it that way. I want to kind of share an experience with you. I got to talk to um, somebody else who's in the near death community, uh, near death experience community, and they found it to be very fascinating. So maybe I could get your take on this too. Um, the way that I came into this work and really awakened myself and the very first time that I really saw myself as being different, um, not my thoughts, but that I could be the observer of my thoughts, was my dad passed away on August 5th, 2015. And he was on his third wife at the time. I was from the first. We weren't talking at that time. And every single time I would brush my daughter's hair before school, I would hear this 
internal thought that sounded like my own internal dialogue. And it would say she needs a hairbrush like I used. And it repeated itself so many times that I saw the thought, I heard the thought, and it com continued repeating all month. And I remember thinking after hearing that, what the hell is happening within my head? The only hairbrush I have ever used is this big old paddle brush. Well, fast forward a month and I'm at work, I'm in this meeting, I get this phone call over and over again from a family member, hear that my dad has passed and out of my third eye, see this vision of my dad combing my hair in our bathroom as a kid before school like he always did using his hairbrush with this wooden handlebar and boar's bristles and I heard um you know their hair is exactly the same it's the same texture my daughter and my my dad and I blurted out to the coworker in front of me my dad's been talking to me now I came from a very Christian household where this was not accepted whatsoever but thank goodness I was in front of this woman who was so open to this kind of work she pushed me to get into it and said you have to figure out how this is happening so um, that was one experience. And then about eight months later, I ended up having this visitation dream from like with my dad, that was the most real experience I've ever lived where I felt that I was physically on the other side. I felt like I had come home. My soul was finally home. I felt like I was in a physical body. We were having this huge party at my home on the other side. And out of the corner of my eye, I kept seeing my dad, my dad's body, just like walk around. And finally, after a while of me chatting with friends and family members, he came up and he said, well, we should have a conversation. We should talk, shouldn't we? So we went outside and the scenery changed to a very comfortable place, a lake house that we used to go when I was a child. And we were sitting on the dock. My dad was the type of father in this lifetime where you didn't have a voice, you didn't have a say. So anything that you felt, you internalized and you kind of stuffed down because there was no talking to him. He considered all talking to him, even as conversation talking back. So um, I was able to sit there and talk to him for what felt like the span of two or three hours. And he listened unlike he had ever done before. And he just cried at the end. And he said, Julie, if I could go back and take it all back, I would, but I can't. And I woke up from the dream. It didn't happen in the visitation dream, but I woke up seeing and feeling, first off, being in tears. Um, so much emotion, knowing that I had just visited with him. But like you said, in the life review, in an instant, you have this knowledge you didn't have before. And I saw how because I couldn't accept my dad as who he was in this lifetime, who was a person who was just seeking love and he was constantly cheating on people in order to try to find that love to fill his heart. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't, I stood my moral ground on that, that there was a part to me that I saw pushed away the relationship with my dad. Before then, I had only seen it as his fault, but I I then saw the peace and, and the way that I had contributed um, to the lack of our relationship. And, and at the same time felt this just, oh, it's gonna make me cry, like the most powerful emotion within the entire world that he would never leave my side. He was always going to be right here looking out and that our relationship could even be stronger him being on the other side and me being here than ever before. Um, I'm wondering if, well, I'm wondering if you have some insights into this. I'm also wondering if what you see in a near death experience can also be experienced in a visitation dream. 
Beautiful story, Julie. Thank you so much for sharing that. It absolutely, oh, that, that, that was just a joy to hear because it shows so much of your soul growth, uh, which is often, you know, catalyzed through a connection with our loved ones who are still very much alive uh, in the spiritual realm. And you told beautifully the kind of story of connection towards the end of his life and then months later uh, in that visitation dream. And I've heard hundreds of stories like that. Now, of course, the me before coma the, you know, the rational neurosurgeon who taught 15 years at Harvard Medical School would have tried to put that away as some wishful thinking and hallucination. What I now realize, much wiser than I used to be, is that these are absolutely real encounters of connections with loved ones that are true and real. In fact, the, the connection with a loved one who has left the physical world, to me, is the stamp of approval that means this is an authentic and real experience. Pay attention. I would like to alert your um, your listeners, uh, if they don't know, um, there was a contest held, held last year. Robert Bigelow, aerospace engineer in Las Vegas, put up some money, uh, and he asked the question, what's the best scientific evidence uh, for survival of consciousness beyond permanent bodily death? Okay? Good question. Is there a real true afterlife? And he wanted scientific experts. So in fact, he demanded that if you wanted to write an essay for this contest, you had to show at least five years experience scientifically investigating the afterlife. Now it turns out they uh, received more than a thousand applications, incredible interest in this contest. Uh, they ended up receiving 204 papers. Uh, some were written by more than one person. So, you know, this represents more than just 204 opinions. Uh, but anyway, they selected, originally they were going to have uh, first, second, and third place prizes, but they were so impressed with the quality of the papers, and they had six excellent judges, some of the most globally well-qualified judges to do this competition. And they ended up accepting 29 as winners. And those essays are all available for free to the public. Now, go to bigelowinstitute.org and start reading. Now, the reason I bring all this up is the very first, the winning essay by Jeffrey Mishlov, uh, who happens to hold the only doctorate degree in parapsychology ever granted in, in North America, um, and he's done more than 50 years of work in this field, but he got into it because he had an experience just like yours. When he was very young, his great uncle Harry, who was very close to him, passed. And in the middle of the night, there uh, Jeffrey was out in California, and he had this beautiful visitation from his great uncle, who he was close to, uh, on the great uncle's way away from the physical world. And it was so shocking, real, brought him to tears, to singing, incredible joy and mirth that it led to his whole career of a life spent studying this. So when you read his essay, first place in the Bigelow Constitution, you will see why. And the rest of these essays all come at it from different directions. They're incredibly valuable. What these essays all indicate, starting with Jeffrey Mishlov's winning essay, is that the scientific evidence for the reality of the afterlife is indisputable. Now, as a scientist, if you want to claim otherwise, all you're doing is claiming willful ignorance. If you start reading these papers, you'll realize the evidence is overwhelming. It has to do with quantum physics. It has to do with neuroscience, the hard problem of consciousness, with a binding problem and philosophy of mind, with all the evidence for non-local consciousness out of the world of parapsychology, things like telepathy, remote viewing, um, distance healing, power of prayer, things like that. But all of this evidence lines up to show us very uh, critically and um, uh, really and rationally that our conscious awareness does not end with bodily death. And so our loved ones are still existent in some way in this universe, and they can communicate with us. You benefited from that personally. There are literally hundreds of millions of people who share your story. They've been through the same thing. But of course, our culture says that's not real. You know, 
pay it no mind. And of course, some of our religious systems, you had mentioned the Christian household, where this is the devil's work. It shocks me no end how the evidence that supports the reality that Jesus Christ portrayed back in his lifetime is writ large in near-death experiences. They all come back. You, we must love each other. We're all in this together. That's the deepest message from NDEs. And yet church fathers are so frightened because they haven't had their own spiritual experience that they have to tell you, pay it no mind. Let's keep just believing the Bible and its teachings uh, and having these beliefs, but none of these actual dynamic, realistic encounters with loved ones on the other side should we take seriously. That is the sign of a church father who's never had a spiritual experience and knows nothing of what they're speaking. Uh, in fact, modern Christianity would be greatly relieved to find how much NDE support it. But crucial point, this is not just about Christians. All living souls have access to an infinitely loving God. And that's why I came back realizing uh, I called that deity, that God force. For me, God was a puny little human word with a lot of baggage. So I called it in the book, Proof of Heaven, Om, um, because that was the sound I heard in that realm, that resonance of eternity and infinity, that Om um sound was so reassuring. And that was part of my meditations that brought me into that home. But the important message here is all of the great faiths converge towards this great wisdom of love, compassion, kindness, forgiveness, and mercy. But NDEs go further than any of the religions to take us to that true depth of love, the presence of God, God as a healing force, every bit of that. We don't need the religious scripture from thousands of years ago. We can go with the incredible power of testimony of people who have been there in the current era. There's a beautiful book I often recommend about this topic. It's by a good friend, uh, Christopher Kops, C-O-P-P-E-S. He's the head of the Dutch International Association of Near-Death Studies, or at least he was a founder of it. And his book is called The Essence of Religions. And in that book, he looks at the five major faiths of the world today and talks about how each of them uh, tries to mimic the deep wisdom of near-death experiences. None of them get it exactly right, but the more they focus on love, compassion, passion, mercy, um, acceptance, forgiveness, and all inclusiveness. None of this, you know, it's our, our way or the highway. You guys are no good, which is what some religious fanatics do. And it's, it's horribly uh, away from the original message of Christ, of, of, of Muhammad, of, of Buddha, of Swedenborg, many of the great mystics and prophets throughout history have talked of this loving God force. And that's where NDEs draw the focus. And not about you know, being a member of this religion or that religion. The important thing is to live the life exemplified by the prophets of, of love, compassion, kindness, forgiveness, and mercy for fellow beings. That's the important thing to do. And not claim theity, uh, fealty to some particular uh, dogmatic uh, ideology. This is really about rising above the petty little human ideologies and realizing through personal experience, through meditation, centering prayer, we can all come to develop this relationship with this one mind, with this God force of pure love at the core of the universe and bring it into our lives. And the sooner we reject the complete bleak and fault, paltry fiction of materialism that portends that your birth to death, nothing more, brain creates consciousness, that is a myth. And the sooner that goes away, the better for this world. And let's get out of these crazy ego minds where we're so self-focused. We're drowning in a toxic soup of, you know, ego maniacal uh, insanity. So it's really time to broaden our awareness, realize we're all in this together. We're here to take care of each other. Uh, and that is the deepest and most profound lesson that NDEs are here to tell this world. Yeah. So that, that's a totally on point. Um, you look at what's happening in the world and you think maybe, I think maybe, how do you come? How does that, that's a very high level perspective. How do we bring it down into individuality and actually put it into action? And in a way where people's voices are heard, changes being, being brought about, everybody is seen as one, everybody is seen as equal, we fix the planet and do so in this oneness space without 
there there are there are just so many radical groups up out there that are to so many different extremes without those groups hijacking the loving space that the collective is coming to and taking it in their radical direction well remember that a lot of the uh kind of tool of of the ego and and these groups the polarizing groups that are trying to control the world in many ways just have ego out of control that's what's happened in those groups and so what you what you realize is it's very simple to kind of see a way around that and that is this is not just about fear and anxiety those are the tools the ego uses to control you that's why addictions can be so deadly uh, you know, we uh, as of March 2021, we had uh, uh, more than 700,000 Americans die of uh, of drug ODs in one year. OK, so that is a horrific societal problem. Uh, addiction is an ego disease. And this is all about this insane focus on the ego. And again, fear and anxiety. You see it not just as a tool of the ego within us, but of egos trying to take over the world, like in the political sphere, where uh, fear and anxiety are absolutely used as tools by some of the weak and most corrupt politicians, uh, as opposed to realizing we're truly all in this together. We're here to take care of each other. This world can become a far greater place. Uh, for example, you know, I look on the uh, homo sapiens, we call ourselves wise, homo sapiens, that's what the word wise means. Well, yeah, that's kind of true. And I look at the success, successes of science and technology in the 20th, early 21st century in medicine, transportation, um, communication, et cetera. Yeah, we've had some amazing successes of science in understanding the universe. But look at the dark underbelly of what else is going on due to corporate greed, egocentric greed, accumulation of wealth. Oil companies are killing this planet. We've known for more than 100 years that burning carbon fuels would lead to global warming. And, you know, when I was training in medicine back in the 70s and 80s, um, we all just thought, well, that's a problem for our grandchildren's grandchildren, you know, uh, that that uh, carbon dioxide buildup. Well, no, it's not. Every single report coming back from uh, uh, various groups monitoring the situation is much worse than the report of a year or two years ago. Uh, and it's because we're so ignorant, we've completely missed how badly we've gotten ourselves into a fix where our addiction to fossil fuels, uh, with this buildup of carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases, global warming, we are on the verge of a pure self-administered um, hell. That's what uh, the insanity of egocentrism and uh, technology gone berserk is leading to this planet. Now, we've enjoyed a benefit for the last century where the ocean has served as a beautiful buffer. So in spite of our excesses of insanity, burning all this, uh, this fossil fuel and biomass, putting all this CO2 in the atmosphere, which is just madness given all the rise in superstorms, uh, droughts, fires, uh, floods, et cetera, uh, it's just absolute insanity, and yet we keep doing it. Uh, and this is where this world needs to wake up and realize that that kind of greed, corporate greed, and you know, keeping everything, you know, trying to uh, have the best toys that burn the most uh, fuels, et cetera. Um, you know, that's not the way forward. We need to, as a so society, condemn those excesses of, of uh, greed and of burning fossil fuels and of worsening the planet. Uh, I mean, the worst thing to me uh, are the threatened extinctions. Somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of our current species are acutely threatened with with extinction from this planet. This whole biosystem has taken hundreds of millions, if not billions of years to evolve. It's very delicate, very beautiful. And yet we homo sapiens are wrecking it through our stupidity, our ignorance, our willful blindness to the facts around us as the world burns and drowns. Uh, it is high time we woke up and saved this planet. And all of our fellow species that are getting burned in these forest fires, drowned in the floods, et cetera, they will greatly thank us for not being the murderous species that Homo sapiens has turned into in the last century and a half. So I just want to clarify here for everybody that 
oneness, compassion, empathy, love that we really get from near-death experience does not mean laying down as a human being and being a human being doormat. It means taking action with love to save this planet. It means taking action with love to bring people to oneness, um, correct? Absolutely. That's a beautiful way of putting it. And you've hit the nail on the head. The, the real key ingredient to all of this is love, unconditional love, not, you know, putting conditions on it. We're, we're kind of used to that as humans, uh, especially like in romantic relationships. Often there's a condition there. Uh, but you realize when you get to a point where you have an unconditional love for the partner that you've gotten to a whole new level. Uh, and it's that's really the way it is with the world at large. And the more we can come to bring this love for others, serve as a conduit for that love, that is a way of receiving and benefiting from that love of the universe, but not through some egocentric self-focus. It's more about realizing the one mind is true and real. We are in this together. We are sharing one mind, as Erwin Schrodinger, one of the founders of quantum physics, so rightly observed uh, almost 100 years ago, that there, there might be a multiple simplicity of physical beings, but there really, in truth, deeply is only one mind. And we share that mind with our fellow sentient life throughout the cosmos. And that life is one that we need to aspire to and grow into. And that is a much higher form where we take responsibility for our choices and how we steward this planet forward. Awesome. All right. I can't let you go without asking this one more question because I really want to get your insight into this. As I have come into my own spiritual awakening, holding what I call oneness on a daily basis, just this ease and peace and love that I feel radiating throughout my entire body, auric field, um, it almost feels like you have to be able to shift gears sometimes, right? Like I'm a mom and I have a household and I run a business and I've got two podcasts and I've got different things going on. And you shift gears maybe into looking at your emails and, and the day-to-day to-dos. I've noticed that within myself, it was very easy to come into spiritual awakening. And a lot of people talk about grounding, but I don't feel as much grounded as I feel this liftedness out of my crown chakra, this euphoric oneness where I almost feel like I'm levitating in an unconditional love. Um, I gotta say, I don't feel it as much within my physical body unless I bring my attention there. I feel it much more within my physical being. And I'm starting to notice how there's different things that have come up with me. I've developed a voice disorder from talking so much and maybe allergies and acid reflux and different things come in. And as I've kind of gone through some different health challenges, minor, but still there, I'm noticing that even though I'm in this beautiful, loving energy, there's still this clenched feeling within my physical body. And I wonder if you could speak to embodiment and how you actually bring loving oneness energy, unconditional love into the physical body, or do you see them as two separate things? No, I don't see it as separate at all. And in fact, you're really hitting on a major point. What, one of the greatest, um, I, I love another quote of Erwin Schrodinger, you know, who developed the, the, the uh, wave equation for quantum physics. So that was Schrodinger's equation as everyone calls it, but he also had something he referred to as his, Schrodinger's second equation. Uh, and that was Atman equals Brahman. It was an observation from, uh, from the Eastern mystical traditions that the mind of the universe overlaps with the mind of the individual. And in many ways, they are not separate, becoming one. So in other words, to get the deepest truth of our relationship with the universe, we don't want to wall off anything. We want to connect every bit of that. And that's something we can do in meditation. When we enter that timeless space of, of the meditative experience, the first thing I do is to let that ego voice in my head, the linguistic brain, the Evan Alexander voice, uh, state of an intention, make a request, ask a question, what have you, but then it goes into timeout. And that's where I have learned over a decade of daily meditation using sacred acoustics 
very powerful forms of becoming one with that neutral observer, uh, with the awareness. So in other words, your thoughts are there, but the thoughts are not what mean you exist. Rene Descartes should have clarified. He said, I think, therefore I am. But he should have said, I am aware of thoughts, therefore I am. It's not the thoughts that are you. It's the awareness that is you. And that's the part that actually expands uh, during a near-death experience when liberated from the shackles of the physical brain and body, from the apparent here and now and sense of self, but into a much broader uh, kind of one mind, kind of God mind uh, look at the universe. And that's why this can be so beneficial uh, through meditation, centering prayer. These are all ways of connecting every bit of it, Atman, uh, uh, and Brahman are equal. And what that means is the universe is self-aware. The universe is a mind, fundamentally, much more so than a physical place. Uh, and we are all part of that mind. And that's where we start to gain tremendous power over our lives. You know, people make the mistake in, in science of thinking that it's all bottom-up causality. That is that you look at the electrons, the quarks, the protons, the photons, et cetera, understand how they interact, and then build that up. And that explains the entire world. Well, that is not true. What that explains is a whole world of potential, but it doesn't explain the world as it actually evolves and occurs. To explain that, you need to realize there's a mental or spiritual layer of the universe with top-down causality. And that's exactly how all of this is really working. So the materialists, like I was before my coma, would, would uh, scoff at you if you claim to have free will. They think it's all chemical reactions, electron fluxes in the brain, following laws of physics, chemistry, biology, that your free will and consciousness is an illusion that doesn't even exist. That's what materialist science would try and claim. And what I will tell you is they've got it 180 degrees wrong and backwards. They are dead wrong. And that's where we go in living in a mindful universe and explaining uh, this objective idealism, the uh, uh, notion of mind over matter and how uh, much influence mind can have over matter. And, you know, in medicine, that's not a new thought because, for example, placebo effect has been there for, uh, um you know, at least six, seven decades. And placebo effect is nothing more than an admission by medical science that a patient's beliefs, thoughts, and attitudes have tremendous influence on their health and healing. And that's just the beginning because there's much more healing that goes on than just a uh, placebo effect. Uh, go to noetic.org, Institute of Noetic Sciences website, put in uh, spontaneous remission as a search term. You'll find a book of 3,500 cases of people who healed from cancer, from infections, from all kinds of things beyond any medical intervention. And they're now redoing that database. Uh, Helena Wabe out at uh, IONS is redoing that database, which would be fascinating, 30 more years of data. And then, of course, you have miraculous healing in near-death experiences. That's kind of the creme de la creme of these uh, beautiful examples of healing by connection through the spiritual uh, layer of the universe. That top-down calls a layer of that God force. And we all have access to that. And that's where uh, we don't have to be slave to the modern stupidity of materialistic science that keeps pretending due to its willful ignorance of the literature that you can find, for example, at BigelowInstitute.org, um, you know, they keep arguing nonsense. So who cares what materialist scientists have to say if they haven't studied this literature at all? They have nothing meaningful or useful to contribute to the conversation. But this is really about all of us growing into this higher form of connection, sense of the one mind, sense of a will in the universe and a will that we can influence this world for the better, that we can help the least, the last and the lost, and that we can shift from our egocentric toxic living to one that's much more uh, satisfying as a spiritual being to help others uh, and to serve as a conduit for love, compassion, mercy, kindness, and forgiveness. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Evan Alexander, I could literally talk to you all day, probably for weeks or months on end. Thank you so much for blessing us um, with your time, just being here. You have three different books. We'll put all of those up on the website. Um, you have a website yourself. Tell yes, people evanalexander.com. It's E B E N. Uh, highly recommend that. And of course, sacredacoustics.com for the meditation. 
And then also a series of free webinars, interviews that we did with world experts on consciousness available at unitedinhopeandhealing.com. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me on, Julie. It's great talking with you. And thank you for what you do, getting this out to the world. Thank you. Beautiful soul, thank you so much for joining me today. My name's Julie. You know I'm all about connecting you with messages from your angels and loved ones on the other side. If you've been listening today and you're super excited and just have to know which angels are around you right now, who's connecting with you, and what messages they have for you, go to theangelmedium.com. Register for a session. You can do a reading with me or a member of my team, and we can help you in making sure that your angels are doing the very best they can to support you and guide you to your best life. If this sounds like you, virtual sessions, they're only offered on my website. Sign up today. And if you're the person who's really excited, you can sign up for my Angel Reiki School to become a certified angel messenger. That's for the healers among us who feel called to grow their intuition to the max and serve humanity with their gifts. You'll learn Reiki, mediumship, how to deliver angel messages, and how to get clients. That's the Angel Reiki School at theangelmedium.com or DM me on Instagram at Angel Podcast with any questions. Before you go, connect with your angels by placing your hands on your heart. Take a deep breath. Imagine a doorway filled with God's unconditional love is right in front of you. Step into that love and feel it as it fills your body, chakras, and auric field. Now ask your angels, what would you have me know today? And open yourself to the positive, loving messages they have just for you.